So, spark creativity with the assignment. Why not? And uh, this is a, uh, uh, the, the idea of a creativity with a more organized photo assignment like you might have for a, a newspaper. And this is utilizing uh, uh, an electronic assignment system that we've got at the Missourian called Tracks. And just, uh, it, and, but it, coming into uh, a, a school newspaper situation where maybe you have editors and you've got writers and you've got photographers and you're assigning photographers, uh, you know, I think maybe trying to formalize the process uh, about go take a picture of, uh, of, of Mr. Carruthers. Okay, why? Um, so we'd, we'd have a summary, you know, and um, it, this is, I guess this is assuming that there would, um, that there would already be uh, some arrangements made with the writer. And so this is just a, a photo request or a photo assignment. So we want to try, uh, uh, we do not want to be vague and brief. We do not want to presume we know the whole background of a story. We do not want to tell someone else how to shoot. Because as soon as you tell someone else, I want this kind of picture, or to art direct a picture for someone, um, it's, it's, they, they are missing the, the key element of the creative process. They lose their enthusiasm. It's just uh, too over easy, whole wheat toast, you know, bacon crispy. I mean, as we all know who really like crispy bacon, uh, there's, a, there's an art to making crispy bacon, but if you, but if you, but if you short order cook it, they're not going to enjoy it. They don't, they, and that's, what the, that's not, not, not really what's good. So doing a story in historical society, take a picture of Earl. Mm, shouldn't be approved by the photo editor. Uh, much better. Uh, the State Historical Society is trying to save the old Stauffer building. The building was built in 1883 by great-grandfather of Stauffer. During the past three summers, Earl has used his vacation time to restore the building with his own funds. The site was condemned in 2001. More information than they need, probably. Provides background, helps to say this is why this is, this is kind of an interesting and important story. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, notes and directions, uh, you know, um, uh, behind the locker room or, you know, out in the field. Just, be more, be more specific, uh, if at all possible, about uh, when, how to get there, uh, an address. Just uh, giving a photographer an opportunity, really, to, uh, to work the situation. And then also uh, uh, having your name on there in case, they, uh, if, in case the photographer has any difficulties. Or this, uh, so... Um, Here's, uh, here's the example. Enter the door facing Elm Street. The, door, the other doors are locked. Earl works on building almost every Saturday morning. All day Sunday, he knows that a photographer will be coming sometime this weekend, but please call ahead as a courtesy. Editor John Schneller, reporter, your name at. So this, is, this might be a kind of an interesting uh, assignment for uh, all of your students to, uh, at a newspaper, for instance, to try to do too, to do a photo request that um, is substantive and that would uh, provide the kind of information that might yield a different kind of uh, more, more complete picture. This is an example of um, an, a well-written photo request um, that resulted in a different picture, different kind of picture. This is about Medicaid cuts and the focus of the story is to talk to people in Columbia who would definitely be affected by Medicaid cuts. Bethany's life is dependent on Medicaid. She has cerebral palsy and is in a wheelchair user, is a wheelchair user. Uh, without Medicaid and social services, she wouldn't be able to get around. I'm going to interview her and see what effects the cuts may entail for her. She goes to Morbley Area Community College, loves to get around town. She has trouble speaking, can't do much on her own. Um, she has a personal care attendant who comes in four hours every day. So uh, John Tully, uh, the photographer, uh, picked up the assignment and then uh, you know, has a choice in some ways about making a mug shot a type portrait that identifies who someone is that really has no, nothing, uh, nothing beyond um, license bureau identification standards. Uh, an environmental portrait that really would kind of show uh, the person in their environment. One picture, thank you very much, 15 minutes, you're done. Easy to schedule, uh, but also ones that we've seen quite a lot. And then there's also the documentary approach, which is 
much more time consuming, but can be more rewarding because uh, we're actually able to understand what it feels like to be that person. And so uh, John, I think, did all three, but we're, I'm going to show you his, uh, his documentary approach where he um, spent some time with her. You know, we identify who she is. We're able to see uh, uh, where, where her, school, her school is, how, how she works, how she does her homework. relationship with her caregiver. So it's just a, a real simple little story. Um, portraits. Portraits are, uh, you know, one of the major reasons that I think a lot of people are photographers is they love people. They love photographing people. This is a, these are a couple examples of, uh, of different kinds of portraits. They're both candid. Uh, they're by um, an Oregonian photographer, uh, who made these pictures uh, as part of his POY winning portfolio. But they're uh, both of uh, a woman who cleans houses uh, for a living and just different ways in which to approach it. I think we, I, I would say they're both portraits, uh, even though the one on the right is maybe more of a conventional idea of what a portrait is. The other, we, by having the high camera angle, um, it's, uh, it's showing us and telling us uh, things that the type portrait doesn't. But it's also really nice to see the person's face and be able to see the eyes. Uh, this is a, a portrait by uh, Lauren Greenfield. Uh, some of you may be familiar with her works on girl culture, fast forward. She lives in LA and grew up in LA and she's been fascinated by um, what society does to, to, does to young girls. And so this is uh, an, from an essay that she did about uh, uh, models. Uh, well, they're real people. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I think I think sometimes it's a goal. I don't know. It's kind of scary. Um, sports action. I mean, uh, undoubtedly, if you if for the school paper and for the yearbook, you know, sports, sports, and you've probably got one one or two guys who love sports. And that's great. I mean, encourage them uh, to look at uh, uh, other work, to, uh, you know, to check out uh, the Pictures of the Year website, you know, Sports Illustrated website. There's so many, uh, sportshooter.com. There's so many great resources for that. Uh, but the, our expectations are really high, and so it takes, um, uh, it takes real determination and persistence and the right equipment to be able to do the best sports pictures. So. Um, because it has to be, a, a tele, often have to be a telephoto lens because we have this expectation of really being able to be in the, in, in the water uh, with the athlete. And uh, we want a really fast shutter speed to freeze the action. Um, and yet we're often working in really low light situations. Very challenging stuff. Um, so it's good for them to be able to experiment and to try to, to do things, but also to kind of figure out, well, what can I do as, as a backup? Uh, because I want to try and do this, but I maybe don't have the equipment. What, o what other kinds of pictures can I make? Uh, news pictures. Hopefully, we're not having a lot of news in the schools. But uh, you know, I'd say anything that happens in the school is uh, is something uh, that should be photographed. And even just uh, kids going to, going to class or assemblies or whatever, or opportunities for showing a kind of uh, event-oriented photography. To think about pictorials. Uh, pictures that emphasize the graphic uh, aspect of an environment uh, in which the people are almost secondary to what's going on uh, can, be, can be really interesting. And uh, I think photographs like that can help us understand our environment in a different way. Even though we move through the environment ourselves on a daily basis, having photographs that really have a pictorial quality to them can, uh, can inform us about where we are. Of course, we know this is Tiger, right? And uh, I guess he did okay this morning. We love pictures with surprise, pictures that have an element of uh, the unexpected in them. And, you know, uh, f photographers who are able to photograph with a sense of humor and to show surprise will always have work. And people will always look at their pictures. And they're, um, so the, the one on the left is uh, a, uh, 
an actor in a movie with his, his head double uh, from, you know, some, they cut off his head in a horror movie or something. So it just, it's just unexpected and, and Brett, uh, George Brett in the, the, the Royals uh, locker room with his uh, pet spaniel tugging at his belt is a little bit unusual. Um, hmm? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Lots of little surprises. And to think about uh, different perspectives, just as we did with the, um, uh, the, the portrait of the, the woman cleaning, the high angle perspective. Uh, on the bottom here, we have um, a camera under, underwater that's photographing both underwater and, uh, and the fisherman in, in the river. These are both by Randy Olson, one of our grads. And then uh, along the, um, I think the Allegheny River uh, with the coal transport, and he's got a light inside where the, uh, the barge driver is and seeing the coal up above. Uh, just waiting for moments, you know, looking, being persistent, uh, looking for interesting pictures out of normal situations. I mean, here this is kind of more interesting because of the, uh, the cast of characters. Um, w. Jane Smith's uh, picture of a uh, uh, photo, famous photo essay about the nurse midwife. So multimedia, as we looked at before, uh, has good pictures and has got good caption information, usually delivered in audio form. My buddy Alan Berner from the Seattle Times uh, says the worst sin is to be boring. And so Alan, even if he's photographing a... Uh, a, a sculpture in, a, in an art museum is going to find a way to make that sculpture come to life somehow. So, this, so he's waiting and waiting and waiting until somebody else comes along and uh, tries to make a picture of it and sets the flash off. Often, often as a photographer you don't know what that other thing is, uh, but you know that your challenge is to find a way to make it interesting so other people can really see it. So. Um, the, all, all, of, all of your students, I'm sure, are looking at uh, integrated multimedia. They're looking at stills and video and, um, and audio all put together. And, um, and it, while it's really complicated to do, it's also the happening thing and maybe not that complicated. I wanted to show you uh, an ex one, one project that's uh, uh, pretty simple. It was photographed by one of our uh, uh, grad students, a guy from Romania who was here on a Fulbright, but uh, he had a little Nikon D90, which is not a particularly, uh, you know, it's, it's a thousand dollar camera. Um, and he just gathered the audio with both the, the camera built in microphone and he also did some interviews with the handheld um, Olympus uh, recorder, $150 recorder. And um, he photographed uh, a specific event, a Civil War reenactment. Uh, but even as he was photographing this sort of general Civil War reenactment, he was looking for a specific story within that. And I think this is one of the places in which we often are really challenged to find a way, you know, in, in this whole parade of, of life, the whole smorgasbord of life, how do we decide what to put on our plate? When I was young and in elementary school learning about the Civil War, the answers I got just were not what I was wanting. They just did not make sense. They didn't go in depth enough for me. I've always been a history buff, uh, and of course, history is done and created uh, during wars. Okay, what, what I... Full cock it, and then put it up. 
It's a great bonding to begin with, great bonding uh, experience. And even in, in the heat of battle, you're going to be reaching for one and you're going to lose like five. So that's why this comes in handy. Nick has been in, in training, I guess is what you could call it, for years upon years. And he picks it up and he takes the rules as seriously as I put down them. He understands that, hey, you do not walk up and touch a, a weapon without permission. And there are certain ways in which to touch it and certain ways to accept a weapon. You never aim, of course, you know that. Because even today on the battlefield, I had some kind of projectile go over me while I was playing dead. Good finger play. The camaraderie and the civilization, the reenactors have created or recreated um, of the time era that I can trust him to go out and, and do whatever and he's always going to be looked at whether or not a fellow reenactor knows who he is. Chances are they will, but uh, they'll, they'll keep an eye on him, make sure he's safe, make sure he's fine. It's the same thing with gear. I, I spend thousands of thousands of dollars on all this gear and you can put it down, walk away from it and know that it's going to be there because there are plenty of eyes watching your back. So, uh, these are some of the useful tools for uh, doing this kind of uh, straightforward, rudimentary, really, because it was just uh, nothing, nothing very complicated or expensive about this, this production. Uh, but, you know, uh, often uh, people are using Audacity or Amadeus. Audacity is a free software for editing audio. Uh, sound slides, some of you have got some experience with sound slides. I know there, there's another piece, uh, another pre presentation on sound slides coming up, I think. And, and I think Stacy Wolf was going to talk about video editing a little bit later on, too, uh, in another day. Um, but sometimes you have uh, students who would like to be challenged by, to do something. And I, I guess one of the things that I, th I think can be useful is that uh, they could uh, uh, look at a multimedia project that they really admire and break it down into pieces. Uh, what, what works? You know, what, are, what are the uh, different components? What, uh, what does the audio do? What do the still pictures do? What does the video do? Uh, what kind of decisions are being made in the editing process? What is the story? I think one of the one of the keys for for this the success of this piece. Um, well, wh what would you say uh, if if you liked it? What are the, what or the or didn't like it? What are things you like or didn't like about this this piece? Yeah. The fact that the video was in black and white. Okay. Just like the stills gave it almost to me almost that sense of a picture coming alive. Because there were a couple of times where she started the video with people holding still and they would move. Yeah, and then all oh my God, yeah. what happened? The, yeah. The shot. Mm -hmm. And then at first I thought that was a still, but then I saw the grass moving, and it was crazy. A little creepy, kind of fun, yeah. I like how they have a still, and then the audio is of what's actually taking place in the image. Yeah, that's, that's a really essential element of a lot of m multimedia, is that we want to hear it. We're gonna, you're going to show it to us? I want to hear it. And if, if they're going to be talking about something, I want to see that too. So, yeah. Jenny, were you going to say something else? No. Um, the camera angle. The camera angle. A lot of low camera angle. Yeah. Uh, if you don't have a tripod, you can lay in the ground. I think that's part of it. It also, if, uh, if you want to simplify your background, being, uh, having a low camera angle pushes people up against the, um, against the sky and uh, really helps. Anything else? That, that, I'm sorry? Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, to, to, to find an angle within this larger, complex thing, uh, fascinating. And how do you do that? Well, by talking to people, by thinking, and, and by also just sort of having the expectation, expectation, expectation. He knew he needed to do it. If he was going to have a story, he needed to have a story. 
And so encouraging your students to kind of find a focus. And then this idea of all the ambient audio. A little bit of this, a little bit of this, a little bit of this. You know, it adds a kind of credibility. It's like texture. It's like corduroy. It's like, you know, corduroy is real because it's got these whales, you know, narrow, wide whales, you know. And even khaki corduroy is real. I mean, it just it, the, the, those ambient audio provides all that texture. All the only microphones he used for the vocal work well, no, he, I think he actually he used um, the, the microphone in the D90, which is not great, but, you know, it's not, not awful, really. And he had a little Olympus LS10 recorder, which is about the size of this, and he didn't have an external mic. And so, you know, by just as if you're wanting to, uh, you know, uh, simplify the, the communication process by having a tight portrait, when you want good audio, you'd have, hold it really close to the person too. You, you guys, but you know, a lot of the same principles apply. I actually have a question to ask. In the same way that some audio files complain that the digitized music can never match the old records, is there anything that people say has been lost from all this digital photography? You're asking me? Yeah. <laughs> well, because you go, you go back to... Uh, I grew up, I grew up uh, uh, well, I didn't grow up, but I ate tri for breakfast every morning for years and years. And I, I, love, I love film, and I love the developer. I love the, I love the process of being in the dark and having to have that kind of physical uh, dexterity required that not everybody can do it. And not, not everybody's a photographer because they, they're not willing to read the directions on chemistry, they're not willing to breathe the fumes, they're not willing to be, you know, willing to be in the alone uh, in the dark room, they're not willing to put the extra time in. That uh, what's lost? I don't know. I think, I think people who had that uh, experience, and maybe your students who still get that experience, benefit from knowing the process, the historical process. But it's really kind of, I, I think in many ways, has elevated the game to have Okay, yeah, you can do that, but I can do that. My grandmother can do that. Yeah. You need to, you need to do something better. I mean, c come on, get with it. Yeah. Try, you know, and really to challenge them to try to be more inventive. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Um, do I like it? Not, not completely, but uh, it is. And I, I have digital cameras. Okay. Okay, sure. I still have my film cameras, and they're just getting mildewed in yeah. the basement because I don't use them. Yeah. yeah. I think the elements of, of photography just don't change. Um, and I remember a rule that my professor gave that if you have 24 um, frames on your film, and if you get two or three good pictures, you're doing well. Well, I don't have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. And my husband does his class when I go into a camera shop. There's lots of other ways to spend money, as it turns out. Okay. Um, well, let's see. Let, let me show you this. This is by another one of our grads, and it's about, uh, about a teacher, a first-year teacher. I teach a class called Geography and Cultures for freshmen, and I teach Civics, which is a class mixed between juniors and seniors. And I'm working at Concord High School. This is my first year. Yes, you can. Do you want a lucky dinosaur pencil? I think that figuring out discipline has been really tough. Um, I came from an internship at a much smaller school, and I really didn't have any problems at all. And so having to figure that out with a much larger class load, um, that's been a real challenge. All right. Let's calm down a little. 
I uh, turned 24 years old this year and I get mistaken for a student probably at least once a week still. I've been actually reprimanded by another teacher. I've been told I couldn't go to my mailbox because students aren't allowed back there. Um, it, it happens less often now that more people are starting to recognize me around the building, but it still does happen. Today is June 16th. That's a lie. No, it's not. Yes, it is. It's not a job where you're done at 3 o'clock. I have to take stuff home almost every night. Um, well, I get home and I usually eat right away because we eat lunch so early, so I'm starving. And then I'll usually sit down and do work until I get too tired to continue. So, I don't know, it's usually like 8.30, 9 o'clock. And then it's getting up at 5.30. Um, it's about a 40 minute commute, so I'm usually here a little before 7. There are times when I get overwhelmed and I feel like just crazy and that I don't have enough hours in the day. Two or three times this year I've gotten to the point where I kind of broke down a little bit, but I feel like two or three times in, a, in my first year is not bad. <laughs> Alright, um, this is our last day together. Oh, I'm going to miss you guys so much this summer. I'm going to miss you, Miss Richard, even though I give you crap all year. Oh, that's sweet, Andrew. I think I'll be ready to come back in August, but I really don't think there's going to be one single day this summer where I wished I was in the classroom. <laughs> when you take civics in two years, make sure you get me. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm sorry? Well, you know, it's, it's very simple. This is a sound slides pr pr uh, product, and it's um, uh, a, a video. A, a, an audio interview has been edited a little bit, but not that much. And uh, it's a series of still pictures. How, how, how many of you worked in sound slides? Okay. And so, how do you how do you work in sound slides? I movie and Okay. But if you were going to do just work in sound slides, how do you how do you work in sound slides? You really have to take the audio and tear it down, so you build your audio. You be, you, And you can you can download sound slides uh, free, uh, and they and you can use it forever as long as you don't mind having it the sound slides demo uh, showing on the end product. But Joe Weiss, who uh, developed it, is a really nice guy, and uh, he's got sound slides plus now, where it's a little easier to rearrange the pictures once you started. But this idea of having your your audio and you do you have that, and you plop it in the sound slides folder. And then you bring in your pictures that are that are uh, named uh, 01, 02, 03, 04, 05, so that they're already they come into a sequence, and then everything is distributed evenly along that timeline. And so, if you've got 10 pictures uh, and three minutes of audio, everything will be shown for 18 seconds. If you've got uh, 300 pictures, everything will be shown for you know three seconds, you know less than three, whatever. So you can kind of calculate it that way, and you can move things around, and you can edit it later on, but it's a real simple, straightforward way in which to do this kind of um, original, you know, multimedia thing. Uh, but iMovie is certainly, uh, a lot of people are, are really familiar with that, and people who work with Final Cut. Um, uh, but I, I guess I would encourage you not to be, uh, not to be shy of it and to, to, to think about uh, encouraging, uh, especially some independent study students or uh, people looking for a special project who have already kind of accomplished some of the other things uh, to consider doing that. And the other thing is that you may think that you're in a boring environment, but it is so neat. I mean, every school is filled with characters. You know, some good characters, some bad characters, some weird ones, some. Uh, beautiful ones, some ugly ones, some mean ones, some, and what a what a great opportunity. I mean, we, we have these, um, a lot of students uh, think, well, or what, what is the saying, you know, that uh, uh, the journey is, is, you know, the whole point is, is being there and, and living it while you're in it, rather than thinking that you're, and for students, I think, for them to find stories within their school, what a fascinating thing that they're able to they have access 
Nobody thinks they're really going to ever do any, a story of any meaning, but they can do tremendous, good, tremendously interesting stuff there. They have great access, you would hope. Uh, and it's great practice for, for going on and doing stories later on. The best journalism that happens, I think, happens by people working in their own communities because they understand it, they've built trust in it. They, um, they're there. They're able to, to, photo, to work on it over a longer period of time. So I think that's a, that's a neat opportunity. Katie Barnes was not uh, a student in the school. She was uh, working as a staff photographer at the Concord Monitor in, uh, in New Hampshire. But uh, I, think, I think it was a pretty interesting piece. Two minutes and 26 seconds. Two minutes and 26 seconds. What's the average length of that? Two minutes and 26 seconds. <laughs> well, I don't know. What would you say, Van? Uh, what was the question? What's the average length? That I wasn't paying attention to, but the first thing I noticed when it started was I registered with 226. About three seconds? Does that seem... I, 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 think, I think that, you know, the rule of thumb is less than three minutes. And I think the shorter, the better. Make, making people, encouraging people uh, to edit tightly, it's one of the hardest things, but you know, just as you're, you're wanting, wanting people to edit, uh, edit text tightly, edit photos tightly, you want to edit multimedia tightly. David, our uh, visit to Newsy uh, earlier this week, uh, Jim uh, was talking about their experimenting, and they were doing three or four minute uh, uh -huh. video pieces, and he says we've now uh, lighted on two minutes of being our target. Yeah. Well, and then uh, you can go to, to MediaStorm by uh, one of our one of our most famous and well, uh, one of the photojournalism graduates I'm most proud of is uh, Brian Storm, who runs MediaStorm, MediaStorm.com, and uh, who's done real pioneering work in the world of multimedia. And you won't find a four-minute or two-minute piece on his site. Everything is eight, twelve, fifteen minutes, because his point is that if it's a good story and if you and if you do it well, people will stay with you. But I think for most preliminary, you know, most projects early on, encourage them to do a 30 second piece, a one minute piece. And you know, what, some of the most interesting stories, uh, multimedia stories I've seen, have been one picture and a 30 second audio piece. It's a portrait and a person talking about themselves, or a portrait of the dog and a uh, person talking about their relationship with the dog. But you know, there, there's, so, there's so many, uh, it's such an exciting time to be in, in journalism because we have so many, out, so many different outlets. I mean, everybody's got their own Facebook page, but also uh, you know, can have their own blog, can have their own website, can be... Uh, do, do, how many of you uh, have, a, have an active, uh, have a blog? Yeah, a blog? Yeah. Uh, when, when I'm teaching, um, I don't do it every day of the year, but the, for the, the winter term, I challenge my photojournalism, uh, my, my, my capstone class, the picture story and photographic essay class. These are people who say they want to be photographers. I challenge them to make a picture a day for the semester, and I do it too, and post it to the blog. And, you know, you think people who, who say, yeah, they're, they're making pictures every day, are they really making pictures every day? And what are they making pictures of? If you want to be a musician, you practice. If you want to be a photographer, you practice. If you want to be a writer, you practice. And so I think sometimes it can be encouraging, uh, motivating for students to see teachers doing this too. Although, be careful what you say you're going to do because, as you know, they'll probably hold you to it. Yeah. Um, let's see. Yes. Uh, yeah, just sort of a link up on that last thing. One of the Final assignments to graduate at the end of the year, because I teach adult, it's, just, it's a two semester long class, um, is just what you're talking about now, we call it a photo diary. And I give them examples of people that have done this for years, taken a picture a day for years, or posted a picture a day for years or months. But we only, I only help them do it for the course of a week. But I save it for the end because they amaze themselves with how now they're able, now that we've learned all the techniques and we've looked at all these things, how they're able to really pick out in the course of their day something that's interesting, compose it well, you know, present it in an interesting way, and it always amazes them to see their own, you know, product at the end of that. Yeah. Yeah. What else? There's something I found on Instagram called Photo A Day, and there's a... Right. The, there are different ones, and some of them are really aimed at a teenage audience and are kind of annoying, like, oh, put it a day. 
but one that I found that I uh, challenged myself to do for July has things like one of the days was finger. And I spent my entire day just looking for things that had to do with, with the hands. And I found like it's pushing, I'm not a great photographer by any stretch, um, I just like to play, but it's just having those categories for each day has really pushed me because um, I spend the whole day looking for it. And, and it, it, I wonder if that would work sure. with students. Sure, I think so. Isn't it uh, the, the poet Wendell Berry who said, it is the impeded stream that sings? So I think uh, sometimes we're afraid to conf confine that creativity. We're saying, you know, if I tell them what to do, it's going gonna, it's gonna to stifle their creativity. But I think often saying it has to be within this framework is actually a, a, a great motivation and it can free them up to be really creative within a, a stronger thing. Yeah. What else do you guys want to talk about? We've got uh, 14 minutes and I can show you another project or we can talk. You want to see one more project? Well, uh, I probably won't, I won't tweet it, but I, I could, uh, I, I think this is being recorded uh, as one, one method. I could also make it, it's a keynote, I could output it as a PDF and put it up there for you guys, if you want it. Uh, sensitive topics. You know, there are a lot of sensitive topics in the world, and uh, one of the things that, um, uh, well, I think you know needs to be talked about is is you know the whole ethical framework about what to do, what not to do, and uh, encourage you to, to take the high road, be uh, uh, have high expectations for your students, especially in anything related to journalism or academic honesty, because uh, there ain't enough of it. Uh, and but we we're sort of, sort of challenged so often about things that people say, oh well, this this is okay because it's part of a, a contemporary uh, pop culture. Uh, for instance, we have. Uh, and Richard's head, as, as the, the gov when she's the governor of um, Texas, being put on a motorcycle mama and uh, the, the day in the life of America, a picture that was originally horizontal that didn't fit as in the cover format, and so they sliced and put it, put it together because it, it fit the format and thinking that, well, covers of magazines are not journalism, they're advertising. And so we're, we're bending the rules all the time, and I think it's really, um, it's something to always talk about. I don't think that there's necessarily uh, you know, there's not always going to be a resolution within the classroom, um, but I think if you're able to uh, encourage the thinking uh, and help, ha helping people to establish their own ethical frameworks, I think it's very valuable. This is a, a couple of pictures that were made uh, by a photographer named Brian Walski, the two pictures below were combined in order to, to make the picture above. He was uh, on assignment in uh, in Iraq, you know, watching people shoot and be shot, and uh, and so it's really hard. It's hard stuff. It's really tough stuff. And Brian Walski was a you know long time uh, newspaper photographer in Jacksonville, Illinois, and then had gotten hired by the LA Times because he was so good, and then uh, sent by the Times to to Iraq, and. Um, you know, he's kind of comparing his work with the work of uh, James Noctway and Chris Morris and, you know, the, the, the war photographer, professional war photographers, and saying, I want my pictures to be more, I want them to be more, and is just supposedly fiddling around in Photoshop, uh, adding, uh, adding components from two images uh, in to make one that, was, that more, accurately re more accurately represented the vision that he had. That's like National Geographic, you know, retroactively repositioning the pyramids. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be done. It, you know, it's, it's all pixels. It can be moved around. You can even hide it some, so people don't really know it's, it happened um, if you're really careful. But uh, this ended up losing him his job. And uh, I guess he got an air ticket home, but that was about it. Um, because he, he thought it made it, and, and he, he said he wasn't really trying to do that. He was just playing around in Photoshop and then, uh, but somehow he sent the wrong file. 
And then there was, uh, uh, the Times was a part of a uh, consortium, um, the Tribune Company, it's also owned by the Hartford Current, uh, that also contains the Hartford Current, the, the, the image tech at the Hartford Current was paying attention, had it really blown up because he was trying to tweak the image and uh, saw that there was someone who was in the picture twice and how does that happen? And so uh, it really happens. Um, why use disturbing pictures? It's, it's really a, a hard thing. Sometimes uh, uh, you're faced with uh, really difficult decisions about whether or not you would use a picture in, um, in a newspaper, school papers, or all kinds of... Uh, I know you have a, a couple people talking with, uh, uh, with you about the legal aspects coming up too. Uh, this picture from Bakersfield, California, on the left by John Hart was not uh, maybe as, as awful as a lot of pictures we've seen, and yet it really truly outraged that community, and they were just mad as heck and canceling subscriptions and just felt like it was an outrage to their community. You publish that in New York City, nobody's going to pay any attention. So a lot of it, I think, has to do with the local mores and um, what people are used to and how much you have been able to educate your audience, frankly, as a, as a journalistic entity. And so it may happen over a period of time. Uh, the picture on the right by Stanley Foreman, uh, these uh, kids on a fire escape, um, out on the fire escape because of a fire in the building, uh, it caused some consternation and people being mad, but mostly it caused changes in the laws uh, and inspections. Uh, and so um, I think often, sometimes showing this kind of picture can often, uh, can also um, uh, have positive changes result from it. These are some of the iconic images that m many of us have got stuck in our brains. Uh, Nick Utt's picture on the left, and um, I don't know, there was just um, an interview with the, uh, the woman that Nick, uh, the, the, who's the girl portrayed here, did you hear that interview with, um, some, sometimes, you know, you can look for these um, iconic images, and if you do a little search, you can find uh, all kinds of material about the photographer and the subject who are, uh, Nick and this, and this woman on the left are still uh, very close to each other. The, the picture on the, the bottom by, by John Philo from Kent State is a good picture to talk about for digital manipulation because when Life Magazine published that picture, um, uh, they, they airbrushed out the, uh, the fence post coming out of her head because they thought it was annoying. So uh, sometimes I think what, what happens is that we're trying to do the right thing. Uh, you know, we believe in diversity and we want to be able to portray it in our uh, University of Wisconsin yearbook. And so uh, we like this picture on the left for the yearbook. It's got a lot of enthusiasm. They're wearing the you know, Go Big Red sweatshirts, uh, but we don't have any minority faces in it. So, oh, maybe we can just uh, stick them in there because we want to show that we're really, that we care. We, we want to show we care. <laughs> Uh, and it's, you know, uh, it's not the photographer who did it, it's a, it's a photo editor or a designer or someone, you know, on high who said, could you do this, or we need to solve this problem, or I don't have any more time, or I don't have enough money. Who knows how it happens, but stuff like this happens a lot. And then, what hap what's, what's the result? Oh yeah, I'm sorry, he he's ends up here. And there are almost, are, are almost always ways in which it's detected because of the quality of light or the proportions off, uh, or it's you know, a sloppy technical job, or, uh, or, someone, so, or someone blabs. And you know, we have, the thing is that there are, are constantly recurring examples of this. So you'll never run out of examples to, uh, of this to talk about. But what does this do? It reduces the credibility of the publication. It reduces overall the credibility of journalism or people who pretend to have journalistic ethics but it really reduces the credibility of the publication and, and the institution that it stands for. So uh, I encourage you within your own environments that you, you uh, try to have a, a really high standard. This is um, Patrick Schneider, a very talented uh, North Carolina uh, photographer who uh, made the picture uh, from a fireman's funeral on the left and a uh, very moving picture. And then the picture, uh, so it was published in a newspaper like this, but when he came to enter it in uh, both the POI and uh, a state competition, he decided that that background was distracting and so he would uh, eliminate it, essentially. You know, and it's not hard, you select it, you go to levels, you, you bring the levels way down, you don't necessarily even have to do any cloning. You know, it, there's lots of ways in which to do it. And 
And so it goes beyond. I mean, wh what is the right level? How much burning and dodging can you do? You know, uh, in traditional form. And in the old days, I would have, uh, in the dark room, I would have, uh, next to my fixer, I would have uh, three containers of bleach, potassium ferrocyanide. I'd have very mild for faces. I would have medium for the shadow areas. And I would have telephone pole strength. And I would actually, I have removed a telephone pole or two on my day because I thought it was OK. But one, one of the really great aspects of, I think, of the digital revolution is that uh, all of this is brought out into the open now. And so people uh, in, into the newsroom and other people are working on the pictures too. So you can have these discussions in the light of day rather than in the, in the dark room. So he lost his awards and lost some money. So one other thing that I'm going to uh, uh, tease you with is, uh, uh, I don't know if it's exactly a tease, but um, one of our, uh, we won't be able to watch all of it now if we're going to finish on time. But uh, I'll send you the link to it, too. It's one of our uh, students, um, Colleen McDevitt, who, when she was uh, uh, a senior in photojournalism, uh, one of her good friends had been uh, assaulted, date rape. And then so she was talking with this person about it. And then she heard from, uh, and she said, you know, I really want to do a story about this. It's, uh, it's, it's awful. And, and she had done some reading. She said, one out of every four women. What is, what is going on? And so she started the story. And it, she didn't know if she wanted to do a, a documentary approach or if she was going to do, uh, how she was going to do it. And so finally, she started with one subject. And as she started with this one subject, other people sort of presented themselves to her and said, I want to tell my story. I want to talk about this, too. And uh, it's, it's, um, it's online. She is now uh, working for a nonprofit in, in Seattle, trying to do other, uh, other kinds of taboo topics that aren't talked about uh, and to do uh, media. So it's, uh, I'm just going to show you the opening of it. told him not to. I said, no, don't do this. I'm not ready. I don't want to do this yet. You know, give me a little time. No, 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 no. I told not him, yet, no, not yet. No. I'm not ready. Don't no, do this. No, a million times. No. And at um, some point, and he just I'm not exactly sure even what happened, even but he was on top of me. Around. and He just um, he said to remove clothing. And I was like, you're really drunk. Stop, stop it. it. And I was so and tired. Was and I felt so and sick. And I didn't want to wake up. And the voice kept saying, wake up. You're in trouble. Um, and so I then had to force myself to open my eyes. And he was on top of me. He was raping me. When I was 13, I was raped by my boyfriend. So I was 20 years old, and um, I actually knew the guy. I met him through a friend. I was raped last year, my freshman year of college, when I was 19 years old. Uh, who has forgotten their prom night? Um, that's something we always remember. I just happened to have had a difficult night at my prom night, and I remember all of that, too. He yelled to the other guy in the other room, come on, she's fighting me, I need your help. Then he got really forceful, and he held me down. Um, and so I take, held me down with one hand and took my clothes off with his other hand. Um, and I kept fighting with him and he'd put, take my clothes off and I'd pull my pants, I was just holding on my pants as tightly as I could um, and trying to push him off me. And I started getting really upset and I was like shaking and... I just cried and I don't really know how long it lasted because I kind of just blinked it out, but... He did whatever he wanted to do and I just went somewhere else. and. Um, but after the first time, I never said no. The people, uh, I think each of them uh, told their own story uh, very effectively. And then she, she paired it so that uh, they're, it's sort of chapterized by each of them telling their version of um, the event, uh, how they felt afterwards, the blame, you know, how they were dealing with it now, what they would do in the future. You know. And so it's a very effective and powerful piece. And I think. I'm not sure. Uh, I, I think it may, might be something that you you maybe could use it as an example too for for students. I think it's only about 15 minutes. I'll I'll, I'll send you guys the link on that too. Yeah.
tough stuff. But she's been uh, 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 right. Right when she did it, and it was uh, it was it was interesting how many people responded to it and wanted to talk about it, and how she became involved in a lot of uh, support groups. And uh, it was shown on university campus several times uh, for people to be able to talk about it. Um, you know, I think people who have been through it, but also people who realize it's it's a really an uh, epidemic and something needs to be. It needs to be a bigger conversation.